Good evening. Wow, it's all wonderful, wonderful to see all of you. Thank you for joining. I can see that you're basically taking your, your seats on the front row, the middle row. Welcome to the Prayer School 103 of the Prayer Bootcamp for All Nations. My name is Agatha Ademiju and I'm, a, I'm your host here at Prayer Bootcamp for All Nations. Tonight we have session four of these 2022 um, series of Prayer School. We call it Prayer School 103 and we are going to continue on the teachings from the last um, session, which is the, with the topic is the different kinds of prayer and we have a wonderful man of god a servant of the of god that has has been has been instrumental to the, the everything that you know about me has been instrumental to what god has done in my life he's um no other but our very own reverend reverend Iang okuti Yang. please sit back get your notepads send out your reminders as quickly as you can because this is a time of revelation knowledge because he's going to be yielded to the holy spirit as he serves us this evening in bringing revelation to the people of god so yeah you are blessed to be in this company i'll see you at the end and we will chat very briefly about the other things we have going on at prayer boot camp god bless you reverend your really welcome to tonight. Just take the reins and take us where God wants us to go. Amen. Thank you, uh, Pastor Agatha. I really appreciate the honor to be here and I welcome everyone. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we bless and glorify your name. We thank you, Lord, for how you've been helping us. You said, Father, you'll never leave us or forsake us. And concerning this issue of prayer, it is what you will have, you have us do so we can be intimate with you, we can know your heart, we can follow your will and bring about your plan in this world. Thank you, Father. I trust you, Lord, to anoint every listener here. Anoint their ears to hear and let me speak as your own divine oracle and open revelation to your people in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I just want to thank once again, Pastor Agatha. I'm not too sure I can feel <laughs> I'm the one filling those shoes of uh, concerning the introduction that you gave well to God be the glory. And I'm sure there are other people who had uh, marvelous inputs into your life. Hallelujah. And so today we're going to continue with uh, our issue on the different kinds of prayer. Like you know, this issue or this topic is quite a very broad one. And I'll try to go through the different kinds of prayer as we have right there in the scriptures, particularly the New Testament. So we talk a bit about, we took, talked about the prayer petition, of course, talked about that. And we're going through the different kinds of prayer now. We have the prayer of petition, the prayer of praise and thanksgiving, hallelujah. And you know, some people, as far as they're concerned, prayer is gimme, gimme, gimme. Well, if you had all your needs met, will you still have a prayer life? Well, God wants you to still have a prayer life. And so the highest kind of prayer is a prayer of praise and thanksgiving, which every one of us should be in, engaged in. So we have the prayer of agreement, have the prayer of commitment, have the prayer of consecration and dedication. And that's the one that we pray for be that we, we talked about that last week. We have the prayer of intercession, prayer of supplication. We have united prayer. And of course, then lastly, we have the prayer of pleading your case. Hallelujah. And one of the things I want to quickly touch on before we move, move on. See, the disciples saw Jesus in his ministry. They saw him pray and we're told Jesus had a limitless anointing on him. In other words, the anointing on Jesus could not be increased. He was anointing beyond how anyone could be, ever be anointed. As a matter of fact, his whole anointing is what rests on the body of Christ today. Even though he had all the anointing, he still prayed. And the Bible, tell, uh, Bible tells us, he will wake up a great while before daylight and go and pray. And the disciples watched him when they saw the signs and wonders, they saw miracles that happened in, in his ministry. But never did they go to Jesus and say, Lord, teach us to do miracles, teach us to heal the sick, or things like that. But you hear them say, Lord, teach us to pray. Hallelujah. And so let me begin once again here from Luke 18, verse 1. And he spoke a parable to them that men, and that implies women as well, always ought to pray and not to lose heart. I want you to pay attention to that. Men, women, ought to always pray 
and not to lose heart. One translation says, men ought to pray and not to cave in. Another one says, never give up praying. So praying should be what we do. And prayer is moving the hand of God that moves the world. Prayer is doing business with God. And the business of prayer with God is a very, very fruitful one. Now, before I go any further, uh, um, let me say this. Jesus taught about prayer. And of course, you see different ones all through the New Testament teaching about prayer. But Jesus gave us precisely, apart from, you know, maybe we'll zero it down to two, two hindrances to prayer. The first one is, of course, ignorance is a result of unbelief or, la or, or, or lack of knowledge. So uh, ignorance or unbelief or lack of faith, that's the first hindrance. But there's this other second hindrance Jesus talked about, which we really need to be careful about. And Jesus expressed this clearly in Mark eleven twenty five, 25. And he says, when you stand praying, forgive. Regardless of how strong you are in prayer or how, what kind of faith you may think you have, if unforgiveness, ill will, animosity, that kind of thing, is in your heart, you know, like we say in Nigeria, you know, you have uh, unforgiveness, ill will, or maybe there's somebody that things are not right between you and them. When you see them, like we say in Nigeria, you're the left turn. You see, if that's there, that's gonna hinder your prayer life. So concerning prayer, yes, we must pray in faith. And really, even though the prayer petition is referred to as the prayer of faith, faith is involved in all the other aspects of prayer, all the other aspects of prayer. In fact, you find Jesus, Jesus said to Peter, you know, after he said to Peter, Satan has desired to have to, to have you and to sift you, break you down as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Then he says, when you are converted, remember I didn't say if, he believed in what he had prayed because he knew he got the answer. So when you are converted, he says, strengthen your brethren. So prayer, uh, faith is involved in different kinds of prayers, but applied kind of a little bit differently. There are different ways of applying it, but faith is involved. But regardless of how strong your faith is or where your faith may be, how powerful it may be, unforgiveness, ill will, animosity, any of those will hinder your prayer life. And so we want to see to it that that is very, very, that's not part of our prayer life in any way, shape or form. Now, having said that, we don't really have time to go through to all the different kinds of prayer. But I would say here, I want to concentrate on a particular kind of prayer. Like I said, when we are praying, you see, we are only breaking down these types of prayer for definition. At any time you're praying, you're most likely using more than one kind of prayer. For example, you will be involved, you know, you'll thank God, you extol him, you worship him. Of course, then you go ahead to make your request and all of that. And then you may involve different things here and there. So when you're praying at times, most of the time, as a matter of fact, you'll be using more than one kind of prayer. We're simply, you know, for the purpose of trying to break them down and for definition at times, we kind of itemize the different kinds of prayer. But I'm gonna zero in because the, initially I talked about, you know, last time we talked, I talked about the prayer concerning you, how you pray for yourself, or maybe your children or family, or people close to you like that. But today I wanna to move to this prayer of pleading your case because this is so very powerful. Now I want, to, I want us to realize something. Prayer is based on legal grounds. Don't forget that. Prayer is based on legal grounds. In fact, the, the whole uh, Bible itself is a legal document. We have the word covenant, intercession, supplication. These are terms that are legal terms. So prayer is based on legal grounds. And so uh, this prayer of uh, uh, pleading your case, I believe is a prayer that will help to you know, exemplify and expose to us how we can, uh, let me use the term, turbocharge the effectiveness of our prayers as we pray, hallelujah. Then also, the other thing about prayer is that for us to be effective in praying, you will need, all prayer must be based on God's word. We said it the last time. If you're praying about anything, make sure you have scriptures that promise you whatever it is you're praying about, that way, you're standing on solid ground. Hallelujah. Now, just kind of to begin there, because I want us to see this, how this is applied. Let's go to uh, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Now, this will apply to whether it's for yourself or you're praying for your family members or you're praying for others. As a pastor, I found this prayer to be very useful, you know, when I pastor, very useful in praying for others. Hallelujah. 
especially members of my congregation. Now, in uh, Isaiah 43 here, verse 25 and 26, you see, uh, people will say, well, I, I, I'm a prayer person. I'm not strong in the scriptures. Well, you cannot be a great person in prayer and not be solid in scriptures because the scriptures will tell you how to pray. All right, Isaiah 43, verse 25. Now, this is God speaking now from verse 25, just two verses we're going to be reading. I even I am he who blots out your transgression, which is transgressions for my sake. So this is God speaking now. I'm the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. I will not remember your, your sins anymore. So God's saying our sins and you know things like that. He actually doesn't just forgive us, but he blots them out. So he doesn't even have a, 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 a knowledge of them. He doesn't even remember them. So when you come to God and say, well, Lord, I'm so sorry. This is my fifth time of doing such and such. Well, he doesn't know it's the fifth time because he forgave you all those other times and even forgot that he forgave you. Well, that's how God really, that, that's really how so much he wants to have fellowship with us because we know, uh, uh, you know, sin inhibits us from having fellowship with God. Now listen to verse 26. He says, put me in remembrance. Now this is a legal term. He said, put me in remembrance. Well, God doesn't have an amnesia, but we need to put him in remembrance. You know, I was bring his word before him. He says, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. You know, it says, state your case. Not so you'll be condemned. Kind of like Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us, uh, is it 14, 16? Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy to find grace to help in our time of need. He says to come boldly. Why, how can we come boldly? Well, for one, we have guaranteed that if we're coming boldly and coming in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, and we're coming on the basis of the word, we're not going to be condemned, and whatever we're coming for, we will receive. That's why it's telling us to come boldly. So it says here, listen, verse 26, put me in remembrance, let us plead together. Uh, uh, some translation says let us contend together. It's not so much contend in the sense of being combated. It's kind of like Bible says, come let us reason together. That's more like what he's saying. State your case that you may be acquitted. Now, this is a very, very powerful tool. Like we said, prayer is based on legal grounds. Some people just think, well, whatever God says is going to come to pass. Well, in some areas, yes. For example, the prophecies about the Bible, Jesus coming, whether you believe it or not, is going to happen. You don't really need to try to believe God whether that's going to happen or not. But there are just some things that God speaks to you, for example, like uh, Paul says, uh, said to Timothy, the prophecies that were spoken over you, he said, by them were a good warfare. So there are just some things God will speak to you and they are for you, but they're not just going to fall on you. For instance, if you go to uh, the book of Daniel, Daniel, you know, with the, uh, uh, they were in captivity right there in Babylon. And Jeremiah had already spoken, you can find this in Daniel chapter 9, and said, Jeremiah had, promised, had spoken that the uh, captivity was going to be for 70 years. Now, 70 years was about to come to an end. It did not look like this thing was going to end. And so Daniel began to seek the Lord and pray. And while praying, indeed, as a result of his praying, God did something. Hallelujah. You remember children of Israel, for instance, were in Egypt for 400 years. That's what was said, but they ended up being 430 years. I personally believe, you know, if somebody had known how to take advantage of this, things would have changed and turned out differently for them. But God says he's just looking for a man to stand in the gap, just one man. Hallelujah. So I want us to see how this has been applied. And I hope I can, uh, we can kind of see a couple of scriptures here. Now, Let's, uh, I want you to turn with me. I don't want to spend too much time in some of these areas. If you turn with me to 2 Kings 20, and I'll probably touch on two scriptures. 2 Kings 20, uh, 2 Kings 20 here, we have the story of King Hezekiah. Now, if, for example, then verse one, it says, in those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. So you can imagine this king wakes up in the morning, he's already sick. And then the prophet Isaiah, who's a prophet who's always gotten it right 100%, he 
shows up and says, set your house in order, you're going to die. But we have in verse 2, then he turned his face to the wall and he prayed to the Lord saying, you know, it's kind of interesting, when Isaiah came forward and uh, gave the prophecy, I want you to realize that, that Ezekiel did not turn to Isaiah for help. He just turned to the wall. You know, when you turn to the wall, what do you see? You see the wall. In other words, you see nothing. In other words, you see, you're kind of like alone, but you, by the eyes of faith, you can connect with God when you shut down everybody else. So what Isaiah was doing, what Ezekiel was doing, that he shut out everybody else, just himself and, and God. Now listen here. Hezekiah begins to pray, verse 3. Remember now, O Lord. Remember he's saying to the Lord, and the Lord said, put me in remembrance. So he's saying to the Lord, remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, have done what is good in your sight, and Ezekiah wept bitterly. Now, how come Ezekiah is saying to the Lord, remember? Well, the Lord says, put me in remembrance. That's been a spiritual principle all through the ages in prayer. You know, there are just some things, if you don't ask God, you are not going to put God in a legal position to do. John Wesley, you know, the founder of the Methodist Church, was so effective in praying, he made a statement and said, it seems as though God can do nothing for humanity except someone who asks him. Why is that the case? The Bible, Jesus even told us that even though God knows our requests, our needs, he still tells us to pray. Why? Because prayer is based on legal grounds. You know, when we read this story, of course, when you read further down, as Hezekiah began to pray, in fact, you see here, verse 4, and it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him saying, return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, surely I'll heal you. And of course, we have uh, a number of years was uh, added to him. Now, people read this and they say, well, God changed his mind. No, God doesn't change his mind. The word of God tells us, I'm God, I change not. And of course, Jesus is the same nature as God. And what we got, we're told Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What happened? You see, you, it's because we understand scriptures. God already gave a promise from Moses. I am the Lord who heals you. I'll take sickness away from you. The number of your days are fulfilled. Hezekiah knew the law. He knew the word of God. So when, when Isaiah showed up to give him this news, you see, you and I think it's bad news. No, really what God was sending Isaiah, uh, Isaiah to tell Hezekiah was this. Listen, Hezekiah, the way things are going, if you let things keep going like this, you're going to die. So if you really drill down, this was actually good news. Good news to spoil Hezekiah to do something. If you put it like this, Hezekiah moved from, we may say, the judgment side, as it were, and moved to the mercy side of God by putting God in remembrance. By beginning to say, listen, Hezekiah didn't say he was perfect, but listen to what he said here. Remember now, Lord, I pray, how I've walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and I've done what is good in your sight. He was not saying, look, I'm perfect, but I've done everything as best as I know how with a sincere and true heart. And if I made a mistake, it was not a mistake of the heart. It was a mistake of the head. Oh, you remember, he's not even gotten to the point of making a request before God sent uh, 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 Isaiah back. You see, you see this at play even with Abraham in Genesis 18. You see, God, if you, you have, we have it there, there are three people, my understanding from actually me, at least the way I see it, we have three people, you know, showed up to talk to Abraham. That was actually what we call in, uh, in, in Bible, you know, uh, Christophany or, uh, or Theophany, you know, it was a pre Bethlehem manifestation of Jesus. So God, Jesus, with two angels, because we now see those two angels went over to Sodom and Gomorrah. So God, if you read there, he said, look, I'm going to go down to see if uh, the kind of uh, report, what I'm hearing about Sodom and Gomorrah is actually true. Now, let me speak, let me kind of speak to you plainly. Did God have to come down to know what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah? Absolutely not. He didn't have to come down to see what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew everything. He did not want to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But for him to do something, somebody will need to ask him. That's the legal procedure in prayer. And so while coming down, he had a covenant friend, Abraham, and Abraham had family 
in that area of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Lot was there. And he said, well, let me stop by Abraham's place. What was God doing? God actually wanted somebody to put him in remembrance, somebody to ask him not to bring this destruction. And if you see Abraham was beginning to plead, Lord, will you destroy, destroy the righteous with the wicked if you find 50, if you find this? Listen, God was really literally jumping in the inside saying, Abraham, just ask me to not destroy those people because God tells us all he's looking for is a man who will stand in the gap. Well, Abraham didn't know that. Abraham stopped at 10 thinking that, well, there'll be 10 people in Sodom and Gomorrah and 10 people were not found there. Hallelujah. And so one thing I want to say, you know, you and I should live our lives in such a way that if somebody had to plead our case, they can have a good case on our behalf. You know, that's where we should live our lives. I've seen where I has uh, prayed that way and God has shown mercy to church people. I mean, I've gone before God and said, Lord, this person, they've helped, they helped me here. This is your church. If I need them, you need them. Jesus, you need them. And uh, if uh, this person is out and all of that and they're gone, it's going to affect the work. I have done that. And I've seen God show mercy, not just once at different times. Hallelujah. So you want to live your life in such a way that if somebody had to pray for you, maybe you need a prayer, somebody had to plead your case, you indeed can have a good case. You can see Ezekiah had a good case here. Hallelujah. All right. Now let's proceed further here. Let's see Second Chronicles 20 here. Still talking about pleading our case here. You can do it for yourself. We see Ezekiah. You can do it for others. Now, in Second Chronicles 20 here, I'm sure we're familiar with this story. One of those days, um, we have it there that, uh, uh, you know, Jehoshaphat woke up and all of a sudden uh, he had uh, news that three, so three armies banded together were coming against just the one tribe of Judah. Don't forget, Judah was all joined together with Israel. Now, Judah is just one tribe. Well, it was Judah and some parts of uh, Benjamin, actually, two and a half tribes. So they are still nonetheless quite small. Hallelujah. And so they were banded together, and each of those armies was big enough to defeat them. I mean, and what did Jos uh, uh, Jos uh, Josephat do? Listen now from verse 5. Then Josephat stood, hallelujah, in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord before the new court, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Can you see that he's making a case here? He's talking to God like, a, you know, a covenant partner. You know, even, even though it was the Old Testament, you see the way they are addressing Jehovah, addressing the almighty God. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God? Does that sound like what Abraham was saying? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? See, he's making a case. And, uh, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might, so that one is able to, that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham and your friend forever? See, he's building his case. And they dwelt in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name's sake. If disaster comes upon us, you see, if you go back to 2 Chronicles 6, when Solomon was dedicating the temple, these are the things Solomon did, uh, you know, prayed before God and said, when such and such happens, and these people come before the temple, you would hear and help. And Solomon had a long string of prayers to cover practically anything the nation could need. And uh, God proved that he answered Solomon's prayer by actually sending fire down from heaven and consuming the sacrifice and sacrifices that they had, you know, uh, uh, made, uh, they had uh, slaughtered to him. And then he says here, verse eight, and they dwelt in it and have built you a sanctuary, sanctuary in it for your name saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence or famine, says, sword has come against them now. Trouble has come. We will stand before this temple in your presence for your name is in this temple and you and cry out to you in affliction. You hear and say, and now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you will not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and did not destroy them. Now, what's it saying here? These people came. See, when we came out of Egypt, what's it saying here? 
we had the opportunity to destroy this people, but you are the one who did not let us destroy them. Now see how they've come to the waters, you know, generations afterwards. He says, verse 11, here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession. You know, one of the beautiful things I love about uh, Hezekiah here, I don't know if you catch this, he says, here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession. What's that doing? He's making their business, their needs, God's. God, this issue is yours. You know, uh, when I have to pray concerning my kids, I have to pay, you know, school fees and all that. I say, Lord, your children, your daughter needs school fees to be paid. And you're a father who takes care of your children. Well, make your business God's business because we're in covenant together. So it says here, here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For you have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do but our eyes on you. So we have it there. Now all Judah with their little ones and their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of assembly. And he said, listen, all you Judah. Remember when we read in Isaiah there, the principle, let us plead together. So Jehoshaphat has pleaded his case, the case of the nation. Now the spirit of God is pleading his case. You saw in the case of, uh, 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 in the case of uh, uh, Hezekiah, he began to plead his case. And the Lord responded by sending Elijah. So we now have the spirit of the Lord, you know, responding. God said, I will respond if you do this. And today we're in a much better position because of the name of Jesus. So, and he said, listen, all you of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Did you notice Jehoshaphat said, to bring us out of your inheritance. He made it God's business. And God said, all right, it is my business. I'll take care of it. <laughs> Can you see, this is a legal case he's building here concerning where they were. This is a very effective means of prayer. I remember, you know, I attended uh, uh, Rima Bible uh, Training College, uh, Rima Bible College in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I remember Brother Hagin said, you know, they had uh, this prayer group of this woman that was this sister, Sylvia. He said that those women were so effective in praying. And this is what he said it. He said, he, he doesn't know whatever they, what they prayed for that they didn't get. In fact, this is what Brother Higgins said. He said, when you give them your prayer request, make sure you want it because they will get it for you. In fact, he gave the case of uh, a girl that had been missing. This girl had been missing for about 20 years from when she was a teenager, she'd been missing for over 20 years. The parents had not seen the body, nothing, nobody knew where this person was. And all of a sudden, these women just took it upon themselves. My goodness, the parents can't have rest. They don't know what it is and all that. And they just started praying and pleading, just what we're talking about. And there was this woman who led the prayer group and this woman was called Sister Sylvia. And I remember uh, Sister Sylvia, but Hagen told us about this, but one of our instructors said, when he finally met his sister, Sylvia was a very old woman at this point. I said, how did you pray? He said, one thing about what sister Sylvia said, most of you, when you pray, you spend so much time on your problems. He said, no, that's not what we prayed. He said, first of all, we take the word of God. And then when we're, when, after taking the word, the word of God says, then we come to extolling God. He said, we will spend time. He said, for example, somebody needs healing. We'll praise God and worship him and worship him as the healer, magnify him. And we will magnify that so much about who God is. So then when we come to the request, he said the request is a small part. He said, by the time we've magnified God and told God who he is, God cannot say he's not that person. <laughs> he said, because we would have really extolled him for who he is. And then he said, we bring his word before him. He said the aspect of the request that we bring before God is just a small part. Most of it, of what we do, is bringing his word before him, extolling him, magnify him if he's the healer, 
we let him know he's the healer, how he healed this person in the Bible, how he healed that person, how he healed different ones. We know he said that's what we go on all about. Then we vent, he said, after we've done that, we now come and say, God, we've come on behalf of so and so. This is who we're praying about. You healed so and so over there. How come, why would you not heal this person? And after we've made our request, we now go back again to extolling God and bringing his word before him. He said, one of my instructors, uh, Dr. Jones, said, this is the way, when he spoke to uh, Sister Sylvia, Sister Sylvia said, that's what we pray about. He said, most of you spend too much time on your problems, all this. In fact, you see it here. Ezekiah just built the case and just say, Lord, what will you do? You say, when we stand before this place, you will hear and help. And of course, what happened, according to these people, they rose up early in the morning and they began to minister to the Lord. And we're told the Lord set ambushment against, against uh, the three armies that they began to attack themselves. And what happened eventually, one person, one army helped to do, two, two of the armies turned on one of them and killed them, after which they turned on each other. See, God actually fought their battles, didn't he say? The battle is his. And not just that, at the end of the day, there are so much riches and wealth they carried with them away in that battle. Hallelujah. And God showed himself so strong. Now, um, all right, maybe I'll try and sneak in this because there are many examples of the scripture, so many examples. But let me come here to Acts and you see the same thing. In Acts chapter 4, uh, let me just, let's come here to verse 23. Once again, the church here was facing persecution. The church was being attacked. So much was happening and all of that. So the church did not cause for, call for, you know, a summit, a peace treaty. No, because the devil, they knew where the persecution was coming from. It was the enemy. So, but listen, so Peter and John had been jailed as a result of the healing of uh, the man at the gate called Beautiful. And they had used the name of Jesus. So verse 23, and we're told, Acts 4, being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God in one accord and said, so this is a summary of the essence of what their prayers was. It didn't, it, it's not necessarily saying they all prayed this word for word. No, this is just a summary. Listen to what they, what they pray. Lord, you are God who made heaven and the sea and all that is in there. Do you realize that aspect of extolling God, magnifying him for who he is, and especially in the area of what you want to do is a vital aspect of your prayer. Hallelujah. He said, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea of all that, uh, all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant has said, why did the nations rage and the people plot, plot with vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, where the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose are determined to be done. Now look on their threats. Look at the request here. Grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Hallelujah. But you know what? As a result of their prayers, if we come here to the next, uh, to the next uh, chapter, Acts chapter 5. In fact, when we begin reading there from verse 13, Acts 5 from verse 13, see there, as a result of what they prayed, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all in one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest there joined them. See, Nobody joined them. Yeah, you know, people just join churches, join organizations. It says, but the people esteemed them highly. Listen now. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. At least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on them. And so we're told here, also a, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Isn't that the answer to what they prayed about? They were all healed. Hallelujah. 
Now, you know, I could go on and on and give uh, different instances all through the scriptures, but I want you, uh, let me kind of, uh, uh, kind of, you know, bring some things to your attention. This principle of reading uh, our case, putting God in remembrance is a tool, a powerful tool, all of us should be using in prayers. And secondly, we all should live our lives in such a way that when somebody pleads our case, it can be a good case. You know, uh, Samuel was, uh, after God had rejected uh, Saul from being king and Samuel was praying and pleading. But the case was, God had to tell Samuel, don't, please don't talk to me about that fellow. Don't talk to me about that fellow. Because it was not a good case. <laughs> uh, Saul did not live his life in such a way that Samuel could make a good case for him so that he could keep, you know, remaining king and then the dynasty can uh, continue. Hallelujah. And so we realize this tool here, and when we're praying this prayer, the aspect of worshiping, extolling, and magnifying God is so vital. While we're praying, when we start our praying, before we make our request, and after we pray, it is so vitally important. Hallelujah. And we see this all through scriptures. And of course, one of the points I also want to tie in here, you will be effective in our praying if we use the scriptures. I thought you probably thought I'd forgotten about the story of the girl that was missing for 20 years. Now let me kind of wrap up with this. So while doing their praying, you know, they were concerned about the family and all that. And uh, they had a word as they prayed. And they said, hey, this girl is alive. Right? Somebody who's been missing for 20 years. And uh, they gave it, said she will be coming at the end of the month. Her parents will see her at the end of the month. So imagine when they shared this in church, the men in the church said, Pastor, they, they told her, Hagen, you need to shut down that prayer meeting. Everybody knows that girl is dead. Everybody, they were all, you know, it was almost like, and Brother Hagen was saying, well, listen, all we have to do is wait till the end of the month. Wait till the end of the month. Well, cut a long story short, the girl showed up at the end of the month. It, she had been involved in a gang and the gang leader had kidnapped her and actually locked her up in a remote place. She never went out for those 20 years. And as at this point in time, she had given birth to two children. But finally, she returned, the, 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 the guy who had kidnapped him now, as now, you know, it was a much older man and all that, and said, you know what? I think you should just uh, contact your parents, write them a letter. The parents got the letter the day before, and this girl returned back home. He says to us that, you know, when prayer can change things, it certainly can. Well, God's work, you know what? Those women were vindicated in their prayers. They prayed, and they said, we've got to work the Lord. The Lord told them, and you know what? Like we said, prayer is doing business with God. And the key thing, the more we, you know, one of the key things about prayer, we can read about praying from different books, which is good. But some of the greatest things we learn about praying is also when we pray. And when you're praying, learn to get, have scriptures before you pray and try and build a case. Hallelujah. Uh, I hope that we've received something and I trust that uh, you'll be blessed. Yeah, you've been blessed. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, over to you, uh, Pastor Agatha. Thank you very much, Pastor Yang. Um, that was wonderful. And now we'll go to the um, question sections. Thank you everyone for sending your questions. Please continue to send your questions. The first question goes as follows. Thanks for your comments on Hezekiah. I have heard it said that the offspring of Hezekiah in those additional years of his life were some of the most wicked and tur turned God's people away from him. This is cited to infer that we may ask and receive, but it might have negative consequences in the future. Um, in about two minutes, uh, Reverend, can you please give us your views on this? Thank you. Well, you, you can you see, that's an extraordinary point as far as I'm concerned. An extraordinary you know, assertion makes extraordinary proof. Because by the same token, you know, don't forget, uh, Israel was not supposed to have a king, but they had a king. But through that, I'm just trying to show the converse here. Through that came a man called David, who was a man after God's own heart. And according to what we have in the scriptures in the book of Acts, we are told he fulfilled God's perfect will for Israel. So to imply 
that because Hezekiah, you know, prayed and Manasseh, they're talking about somebody like Manasseh came in and different ones. That would also apply to David because these are all part of the lineage of David. And so to now say, well, if it was as a result of Hezekiah staying those extra years that he had Manasseh, that's not actually been fully proven because we don't have anything that Manasseh was, um, you know, born within that last period. But at the same time, my point is this, all of those people were also all in the lineage of uh, David, who was a man after God's own heart. So um, just because you pray, uh, uh, let, let me put it this way. Just because I live my life right and I make the right decision, does that then mean automatically uh, things will be right with my offspring or you know, they will make right choices? No, everybody still has to follow the word of God by themselves and live uh, according to God's word. And may I also then add, uh, God said he loved Solomon, which was, who was somebody right after David, but we all saw how he, he messed up and all of that. So, uh, but God said this, I love him and he will be my son. He will put in all of that, those things there. So to make that point, I don't think we have enough to be able to say conclusively it was because of, uh, that's like saying, it was because of Manasseh's, uh, his guy's prayers that somebody like Manasseh and the rest of them came uh, uh, along. That is too extraordinary a point to make. And besides, uh, sickness and disease has never been God's plan for his children. He already said, I will take sickness from you and the number of your days I will fulfill. So if that had been the case, I think God would have warned him ahead of time. And, uh, we don't have anything to make that extraordinary connection. I don't know if what I'm saying makes sense. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next question. The Bible mentioned that David was a man after God's heart and the apple of God's eye. Why did God not turn the hearts of his children in the right direction based on his love for him and his prayers? In about two minutes, Pastor? Yeah, the same point you're making, uh, you know, our duty is just like God had taught from uh, taught, uh, through Moses in the law. Teach your children, for example, uh, Deuteronomy six seven. You shall teach your children when you sit down. You teach your uh, children all of these things. It is their responsibility then to follow through. David lived the life, and they saw how God worked with him, and he taught them. So you know, just because I live my life and I serve God or whatever. It's for my children to see how I'm living my life. And the point is, hopefully, they in turn can make the choice. Remember, the word of God says, I said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose. See, we have to choose. But just because I live a certain way doesn't automatically imply that I've chosen for my children. They have to make the choice. And we're hoping that they'll make the choice based on what they have seen. I mean, you look at Israel. God uh, was their king before, you know, even when uh, before Samuel and when Samuel was there. And as he led them through the prophets and all that, gave them instruction, they won every battle, had more than enough, and they were prosperous. But they decided to choose otherwise. They said, no, 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 no. Well, because the truth is following God is hard on your flesh. Because there are times God will lead them to battle a certain way. You go this way and do that. There are times they will show up to battle and God would not have said anything, yet the enemies are advancing. And God said, no, he's not saying anything. And just before the enemies come, they're going to say, I do this. Yeah, following God is hard on your flesh. And that's why at times people, you know, want formulas, just want, all right, just let me know, I do A, B, C, D. Well, that's not necessarily God's way. God may do A, B, C, D today. Tomorrow may be G, F, A. That's just the way it is. It's a way of faith. And the way of God tends to be hard on our flesh. And I think the, the, the way of the flesh is, all right, I just want to gratify myself right now. I can feel good about what I'm doing and just move on. And usually it doesn't turn out the way we, uh, you know, expect. I hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you very much, Reverend. Um, the next question reads, when you have a problem, is there any reason why you should be asking lots of people to pray for you? When is a 24-hour prayer chain appropriate? 
Yeah, you see, if, if you have your needs, you can pray about it for yourself. That's where the prayer petition comes in. Or get people to agree with you. Very fine. If two are, you see, once you have the scriptures, Jesus already said, for example, prayer petition, what things ever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have. And then he told us again in John 16, 23, in that day you shall ask me nothing. Whatever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now, the prayer doesn't just end by when I mutter the words to prayer. After I have prayed, there's the aspect of the standing where my life is concerned. Once you have scriptures for what you're praying about, you stand. See, that goes along with your prayer. That tends to be hard on people's flesh. Like we said, it's again, again, hard on people's flesh because, oh my goodness, it's not happening, do this. Yeah, we're tempted to doubt. And that's why I, I tell people, before you pray, take time and meditate on the word. Get it solid, built on the inside of you, unless it's an emergency. If it's an emergency, you don't have two, three days to start meditating. Yeah, pray and maybe get somebody, you know, ask people to pray with you. And But you have to believe God anyway. You still have to stand anyway, even when people are praying with you. Yeah, so uh, you have to stand on your own. So once you have the scriptures, the scriptures tell you exactly what to do. For example, believe that you receive and you shall have them. For example, I've used this case, if I'm believing for a spouse, I take time, I go through the scriptures concerning it. I put my request in, I thank you, Lord, for that person that is my life partner, or maybe for a job, I thank you, Lord, and I stand. And every day, every time I remember it, thank you, Lord, for bringing that job my way. Thank you, Lord, for bringing the person. God knows, listen, God is the greatest matchmaker. He knows how to do it. And when that person comes, you know, when he, when he brought Eve to Adam, Adam, he said, ah, who is this person? Adam immediately said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So when that time comes uh, and God has brought that person to your life, you will know and they will know too. So when Adam said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, Eve did not say, ah, who is this? What kind, why? Don't touch me. She didn't say anything like that. See, God knows how to do these things. We just have to do our own aspect. He will do his own aspect. So if it's a, a, a personal need, you don't need a 24-hour prayer request. No, you don't. A 24-hour prayer chain. You don't need that. That's a different kind of prayer you're trying to put where this is concerned. Thank you. Next question reads, sometimes can we just approach God and say, Lord, please help me. A short prayer without a scripture. <laughs> all right. I'm not saying, you know, my point is, all right, uh, how do I how do I put this? Yeah, if I'm probably on the uh, 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 on the spur of the moment or a situation, on the spur of the moment where I need God's help, yes, I can do that. And I know God will help. That's what we're talking about. Maybe a situation arrived, maybe so life-threatening. So I remember, I'll tell you an instance. I was driving from my university back, um, back uh, when we, in fact, it was just about three months to our wedding. And uh, I was driving from university. In fact, my wife, then she we were not married. She was sitting next to me and we had, I had three brethren at the back of the car. And so the road between Ifa and Ibaka then it was just single lane, one lane going, one lane coming. And while driving, um, I was trying to, uh, there was this trailer, a truck called a no, trailer in front of me, and it wasn't moving fast. So as when we got to a hill, I decided, oh, this is my opportunity to get up the hill and get past this trailer. So as I got past, I got to the side, you know, overtaking the trailer. When I got about halfway the length of the trailer, I was just approaching the hill when suddenly an identical car like mine was coming down the hill. This is you're on a hill, you don't have room, and what did I do? All I could do was Jesus. That's all I could do. Jesus. And why did I call on Jesus? I know the word of God tells me, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The moment I called that name, God is my witness, my wife and different ones. It was like an unseen force grabbed that steering, whipped it off the side of the road and packed it perfectly. It was so forceful. I was so sure that, ah, my tires were gone. My tires are completely ruptured. In fact, when this all was happening, everybody was sleeping. So when I, you know, when this 
hand got a hold and swept me to the left and was packed. Everybody woke up. And by the time I came down, I was perfectly packed. If I had been just a few inches more this way, Akurabi would have gone down the ravine and it would have been disaster. God saved us. Hallelujah. So I know in a case like that, yes, you can call on, you know, Lord help me or Jesus. I'm used to calling Jesus anytime I'm in danger like that. And I've seen it five different occasions where he's helped me. Yes, that can work. But when you have a, an opportunity to truly pray a prayer, take time, go through the word. That's what I'll say. And do your prayer. Yeah. Thank you very much, Reverend. Next question. Do you have a perspective on what types of prayers to use for different situations? Uh, for example, is a prayer of intercession ever relevant for praying for healing or for yourself or for anyone? Or should it always be the prayer of faith? Just you know. No, prayer of intercession is not for you. It's for you standing in the gap for somebody else, for the nation and all that. That's where that is. You're standing in the gap. And you're naming the Holy Spirit to pray for you. Where you are concerned, you already have the prayer of petition, prayer of uh, praise and thanksgiving, prayer of agreement. That will get you whatever you need. Yes. So somebody, two or three people agreeing together with you, fine. I'm not saying, yeah. Uh, for example, uh, corporate prayer could work in the sense that, ah, uh, you could share with the pastor and the pastor says, let's all pray for sister so and so, that's fine. But the moment they pray for you and they've said, amen, you have to, be, you have to believe. You cannot keep going on, especially if it's what the scriptures have promised you. That's why we say you have to get the word of God. God said that scriptures that promise you whatever it is. Are you following me? So you cannot, you know, pray in prayer of intercession. You're standing in the gap. Well, you can't be standing. There's no point you standing in the gap when you can come boldly yourself uh, to the throne of grace. All right. So that's what I would say with that. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Next question. Can you give a practical, can you just explain to us or just give us practical examples with a few words, how to put God in remembrance in the New Testament? Is it reminding God of what he did before or, it's, or is it quoting scriptures or what? I mean, can you just kind of demonstrate very briefly how is that? All right. Uh, putting God in remembrance, take for example, you know, I'm putting God in remembrance. First of all, the point is you bring God's word to him. All right. Maybe I'm believing God for a, a job. I've been out of work for a long time. Lord, uh, I, I spend time. I, Father, I bless your name. I thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. I glorify that you're my Father. You take care of me. Father, you have said to me by your scriptures, uh, I'm a member of your household. And indeed, you take care of the birds, you take care of the plants, and all of that. And if you could take care of all of those things that you created, that you created here for me, for us, how much more wouldn't you take care of me? In fact, you said in your word in uh, 1 Timothy 5, 8, you said, if a man as the head of the family does not provide for his own household, that person is worse than an infidel. Lord, I'm a member of your household. I belong to you. And beside you said in your word, if anybody does, does not work, they should not eat. I am seeking to work. I'm looking for work. And so, Father, Lord, it is in your, I'm coming in line with your word. You want me to work and I want to work. And beside you said, when I'm able to work, I can have to give to others in need. I can even have to, I can have something to give to support your work, to support missionaries, that type of thing. Lord, I put you in remembrance of all what you said in your word. And based on that, Lord, the name of Jesus, I claim a job for me, a job for me that will suit me, enable me to be able to, you know, honor you, to be able to be, uh, uh, take care of my family, do what I'm supposed to do, and also to be a blessing to your kingdom. Hallelujah. And in being a blessing to your kingdom, you have vested interest in this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And I trust you, Lord, to honor your word in Jesus' name. Just something that simple. And once I prayed that, Jesus said, believe that you receive and you shall have. That's what he said. You know, uh, maybe let me, let, me, let me say something here about believing. I don't know. Do I have a few minutes to say that? <laughs> Okay, so it, yes, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Believing, you believe things that you believe, you don't have evidence, natural evidence to prove. All right, for instance, I cannot say now I believe I'm a man. I don't mean to be vulgar. I'm not a man. I know that I'm a man. I can walk into the bathroom and examine myself. I'm a man. I'm endowed as a man. All right. I'm right here in this office. This is where I am. 
You see, I don't need to believe I'm a man. I don't need to believe I'm in this office because I am here. I see the evidence around me, but I can believe I'm in Florida, you know, in a hammock on a beach, you know, swinging on a hammock and uh, sipping some wonderful, nice fruit juice and being served by, uh, you know, in a beautiful resort and the waves beating. See, what I believe I've, is something I cannot prove with my senses. So when Jesus tells me to believe after I pray, all right, I don't have a job. Thank you, Lord. I believe I have a job. I believe you provided my job. I believe my bills have been paid in the name of Jesus. I have funds to pay my bills because I don't have anything to be able to prove that those things are. So we believe what we cannot prove with our senses. So you say, well, I've prayed, I've not seen seen the results. Well, the more the reason for you to believe, it gives you grounds to be able to believe. And Jesus said, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And all things are possible to the one who believes. I hope that helps you when it comes to praying. Now, one of the problems I found with people now, and I'll tell you where healing is concerned. They can, we can pray concerning healing now and they start seeing improvement. They say, oh, they've seen the improvement. So in their minds, it is working. So their faith goes from what the word says, believe that you receive and you shall have to, ah, I now believe I'm healed because I'm seeing improvement. So you've lost focus. You put the enemy right there where he can steal that healing from you. Whether you see improvement or not, you believe to be healed. You still keep focusing on God. So I say, thank you, Lord. You said to believe and I thank you. I believe I'm healed and I will see the glory of God. Amen. So I hope that helps anyway. Thank you very much, Reverend. Um, we have just three minutes to go, so I want to try and squeeze in two last questions quickly. Um, how do we genuinely pray for those who have con who have and continue to hurt us? Yeah, uh, Jesus actually said that in uh, Matthew chapter five. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. We pray in love for them. First of all, if they are hurting you. In I take it that they're doing it intentionally. Maybe even if they're not, pray for them in love. Don't pray judgment on them. Don't pray anything. And the Bible says, of course, they're showing mercy. Blessed are the merciful. They shall obtain mercy. And if they're not uh, believe, and then this is where prayer of intercession can come in. You're standing in gaps and say, uh, I'll bring something to you. For example, Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church. But yeah, if, you, if, I, if you go further here, after the death of Stephen, they would not pray, fall down and die. All you people persecuting us. They were truly praying that this will, they will have opportunity to share the gospel. They weren't praying judgment on those people. Because of their prayers, God reached out there and got Saul of Tarsus, who was the person, the lead persecutor himself. See what God did with him. Got him born again. See what that Paul, Saul that became Paul, what he did in church. See, most of the times, we are carnal and fleshly with our praying. And we kind of think that, ah, yeah, we're, don't get me wrong, to be persecuted is painful. But on no grounds that we see when people are persecuting us because they don't know, they're not of our faith, they're not of the Lord Jesus, we pay, ju pray judgment and everything. That's what Satan wants. Because those people eventually, if they die and everything else, the persecution is going to come, it's going to raise fresh people to do worse, terrible things to us, and it can go on. But look at how the church prayed with all boldness. You don't see anywhere where I pray, oh God, let fire call down from heaven and get these people. Let them fall down and die, which is where we tend to do as believers. Let's pray what the scriptures pray, uh, tell us to do. And we'll see the glory of God. And after you prayed like that, you pray for them sincerely. Say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I'm depending on the Holy Spirit to help me pray. And then pray in tongues. Pray in your prayer language of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Thank you. Um, last question. What if you can't find a scripture that covers your case? Does that mean you can't pray? And there's no can such, I there's no such there's no such need. <laughs> there's no <laughs> such human need. That's that that's not no the scripture. end of the question. Sorry. All right. And also, can I be guaranteed at all times of an answer to all my prayers? and be right. confident that every prayer I pray will be answered. If it has to do with you and you alone, 
it's a bona fide need promised by the word of God. You can be 100% guaranteed. But if somebody else is concerned where that prayer is concerned, that person's will and what they believe about it also will come to play. Are you following what I'm saying? All right. So if I'm praying for somebody, you know, for example, when my children are concerned, when they're still young, still under my care, you can pray for them like yourself. That's straight prayer petition. But if for somebody else, you can't push your own desires on somebody else. But for you, if you have scriptures for it, you're guaranteed. That once the scriptures tell you it is yours and you have grounds for it, you have every reason to expect. Hallelujah. If you stand and pray exactly what the scriptures tell you to pray. Looks like that's all we have time for tonight. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Reverend. This is such a, a good a good meal of the word. And we're just so grateful that you could share your time with us and share those revelations with us. Thank you so much, Reverend Yang. You know you're you know you're the best, don't you? So thank God for your life. And I just want to encourage everyone, these class is recorded so in a, in in probably less than 24 hours it will be available for you to go back to watch listen and more importantly check the scriptures carry out your own um, uh, research make sure that the scriptures are saying what reverend has said reverend taught us very, very early in life that we should always check the word of God. And when we find it to be true, hold fast to it. So if you hear me say, that's the guy that taught me to say that. So I, I want to encourage us. These words are, they're our life. The word of God is our life. And it, it, it determines how much of the inheritance of God that you can actualize in your life. Okay, so I want to encourage you to go back and study, check out these things. Prayer and Press 103 continues next month, the second and third and fourth Thursday of the month. So please join us then. Also to remind you that we still have Spirobic starting on the 1st, which is Monday to the 14th. Also encourage you that... Um, we have um, nights of worship and witness on the 21st of August. We have an encounter night on the 7th of August. And we have question and answer, one hour question and answer at Prayer School 103 at the very last session in October. So have a great evening. We're just going to ask Reverend to pray and we would go for the evening. God bless you. All right, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. And Lord, we've shared as best as we can. But Lord, we trust you, Lord, to be able to take your word by your spirit, what's been shared according to the scriptures, and minister to your people, bring enlightenment and guide them through, Lord, and help them, Lord, Father, to desire more of your word, the sincere uh, 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 meat of your word, whereby they would grow thereby and have results massively in this area to your praise and glory lord we trust you and thank you lord because as we get more and more proficient in this area as we'll see the work of the kingdom being done yes. and your kingdom being built like never before in jesus precious name amen amen and amen have a great evening god bless you and see you at the next class thank you <laughs>